For some time now, I've been interested in a discovery about human behavior called self-image psychology. You may already be familiar with the self-image idea. This is the principle that each of us is controlled by his mental picture of himself. If you've thought much about it, I'm sure you agree that a good self-image is vital to our happiness and to the achievement of our goals in life. But if you aren't yet familiar with this new idea, let me introduce it by quoting my old friend Dr. Maxwell Maltz, who said, The most important psychological discovery of this century is the discovery of the self-image. Our self-image is our own conception of the sort of person I am. Each of us builds a self-image out of his beliefs about himself. It's unconsciously formed from past experiences, our successes and failures, our humiliations and triumphs. It determines the way we interpret other people's reactions to us. In short, this mental picture we have of ourselves turns out to be a kind of life-governing device. Now, that's the most significant part of the whole self-image principle, that our mental picture determines our interpretation of everything that goes on about us, our reactions to life and other people, our feelings, thoughts, actions, even our abilities. We are the person we believe ourselves to be, if we're anywhere near normal, and we're consistently that person in everything. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? It's exciting, too, when we realize that our self-image can be changed. If, for one reason or another, we've developed an image that's too limited to permit our achieving maximum results in life, that image can be enlarged, improved. There's one point to keep in mind here, though. We can't outgrow the limits we impose on ourselves. Our thoughts, habits, even our abilities must be those of the person we believe ourselves to be. We can set new limits in place of old ones. But we can't surpass the limits of our current self-image. There's a story about a Wisconsin farmer who was walking through his fields one day when he stumbled over a little glass jug in his pumpkin patch. Out of curiosity, he poked a young pumpkin through the neck of the jug, being careful not to break the vine. Then he placed his little experiment back on the ground and walked away. When harvest time came, the farmer was working his way down a row of big ripe pumpkins when he again came upon the glass jug. But this time it looked different. Picking it up, he discovered that the young pumpkin he'd poked inside now completely filled its glass prison. Having no more room, it had stopped growing. The farmer broke the jug and held in his hand a runt pumpkin, less than half the size of all the other pumpkins, and exactly the shape of the jug. Well, people aren't pumpkins, but our self-image is something like that jug. It determines the size and kind of person we become. The similarity ends with the fact that we can remove our self-imposed limitations by enlarging our self-image. We form a mental picture of ourselves through experience, and we can change that picture the same way, through experience. If the actual experience we need is not available to us, we can, according to self-image psychology, create that experience synthetically. Now, scientists agree that the human nervous system is incapable of distinguishing between actual experience and the same experience imagined vividly and in complete detail. Worry is a good example of this synthetic experience. When a person worries about something, he projects himself mentally, emotionally, even physically into a situation that hasn't even occurred. The man who worries intensely about, well, say, failure, finds himself experiencing the same reactions that accompany actual failure, feelings of anxiety, inadequacy, and humiliation, and eventually headaches and an upset stomach. As far as his mind and body are concerned, he has failed. And if he worries about it long enough, if he concentrates on failure intensely enough, he will upset himself to the extent that he will fail, and he'll get sick. Now, everything can be used in either of two ways, positively or negatively, constructively or destructively. Worry is the negative use of creative imagination. It's a negative synthetic experience. But most people apparently never realize that positive results, just as real as the negative results of worry, can be achieved through using our imagination constructively. Our minds are complex and marvelous, but like electronic computers, they can only act on the data we feed them. The man who worries about failure is unwittingly defeating himself. He's feeding his mind the wrong data. If he spent the same amount of time visualizing success as he spends thinking about failure, he could reverse the process of synthetic experience. Instead of anxiety, he could develop confidence, self-assurance, poise, and a feeling of well-being would replace apprehension. By concentrating on the success he desires, by synthetically experiencing that success, he can expand his self-image into that of a person for whom success is normal, expected. Why not practice holding the self-image of the person you most want to become? 
this is the person you can become. If you feel you'd like to enlarge your self-image, then I'd like to invite you to join me in some image building. During the next few weeks, listen to this message at least once a day. This way you firmly implant in your mind the concept of the self-image. Use your spare moments to concentrate on your goals and the greater success you seek. Analyze your past successes and formulate ways your success can be increased in the future. While on the way to work, between appointments, while waiting to see a client, these are all excellent times for directing your attention to positive, constructive thoughts. Put more into the positive use of your imagination than you ever put into its negative use, worry. You're merely reversing the same creative process. Now it's working for you instead of against you. Now, since the mind works best when we feed it only one set of instructions, do not worry if you can help it during the course of this exercise. Your creative imagination can enlarge your self-image appreciably in just three weeks, and it will if you just let it. Nobody pokes us into glass prisons beyond which we can't grow, but all too often, almost unknowingly, we set unnecessary limits for ourselves by holding a self-image that's restricted, inadequate for the full realization of our potentialities. Each of us is, at this moment, the product of all his thoughts and experiences and environment up to this point. Through thought, we can control to an almost unbelievable degree both our experience and our environment from here on. Whether or not we choose to direct our own course through life is entirely up to us. The important thing is to know that it can be done. This is Earl Nightingale, and thank you. Have you ever watched Jack Nicklaus play golf? Of course you have. He was a golfing phenomenon never before seen in the world of golf, winning more major championships and money than any other golfer who ever lived. He still shoots a great game of golf, and no doubt's a long way from through winning tournaments, although he takes it much easier these days and busies himself with his many other interests. When Jack Nicklaus got ready to hit the ball, he'd have an intermediate aiming point, just a short distance from the ball. This intermediate aiming point was on line with the route he wanted the ball to travel. He would look down the fairway toward the green, then at the intermediate aiming point, then at the ball. His first task was to get the ball to pass over the intermediate point. If it did that, it would probably land very near the point on the fairway or green he had selected. It was always interesting watching his head and eyes move to the intermediate point, then to the distant point then back to the intermediate point, then back to the ball. When he was ready, and not a moment before, he would uncork that legendary swing that left the gallery gasping and whooping with admiration and wonder. The ball would compress flat and be off and away on its considerable journey. It was the same with his short irons near the green. He always had an intermediate point with which he could line up his club head in the ball. We need intermediate aiming points, too, before we can successfully reach a substantial, distant goal. To write a book, one must write the first chapter, then the second, then the third, and so on. The book is first in outline form. The chapter is roughly sketched as to subject matter and content. One can get a mental picture of the book in final form with its colorful dust jacket coming from the printer. That's the goal. But first, there's that first chapter then the second, and so on. Each chapter must be successfully completed as an integral part of the project before the project's complete. And it's much the same with our big goals. Ah, we can see it as completed, with ourselves right in the middle of it. There we are, the job done. That's where we want to land. But first, there are the intermediate points to successfully complete. And it's the intermediate points that often prove too much, or too difficult, or too time-consuming, for the person to spend all that time completing and polishing. These are often the core skills vital to the completion of the final project. Here we find the person who wants to amaze his friends with his skill at the piano, but doesn't want to put in the time and effort to learn to play. This is the person who's forever looking for shortcuts. He or she daydreams, but when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of the intermediate goals, ah, that's... That's too hard, or boring, or time-consuming. Want to write books? How about learning the language first? Want to get rich in real estate? Learn the business first. The first step of the successful goal person is commitment. There are no ifs or buts about it. He or she is fully 100% committed 
to the achievement of the goal and willing to take whatever intermediate steps are required. The bridges are burned. There's no escape route on which to come tiptoeing back when things get rough. Commitment, 100%.